Okay. So if you'll turn to your first page in the handout today, um, this one, uh, this very first page in this, hand, this very first handout of session one, it deals with uh, how the book of Revelation is set up, but also this class. The very first session today is going to be why we study prophecy and the things to come, the 24 elders, um, the first resurrection, and the rapture segment. So these, these, are the very, these are the elements that we're going to study. We'll probably dive off into other areas of scripture and understanding of uh, Revelation and end times off of these main subjects, but that's session one. Session two is going to be on the judgments. It's going to be about the seals, the trumpets, and the vials. Has anybody read through Revelation and really maybe didn't understand what all of these seven sets of everything is in Revelation? Well, these, that, the next session we'll talk more about that. Session three is going to be about the beasts of Daniel and Revelation. Um, if you've ever read through Daniel or Revelation, you've noticed there's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of creative uh, images that you can see with your mind. Uh, just be warned up front that not every image that you read is an actual image of a beast or a, a seven-horned, seven-headed thing that's actually a living creature. But this is imagery that's built in the Jewish mind. The Jewish mind is, uses imagery to portray, just like Jesus did with his parables, a story or an image that represented something that was spiritual. And so when we read about all of these beasts, except for one particular beast in the in the in the uh, in the uh, book of Revelations, talking about the the mark of the beast, that's a different type of understanding. But every other beast has has tied to it some imagery. And that imagery is what the Jewish mind used, such as John's mind. He used that to portray, to color, to paint a picture of something that represented maybe a government, maybe a system, maybe a religious philosophy, or other things like that. And so we'll get to, to that more and more as... Uh, Time goes by. If you'd like to have a table, we have some open space up here. You're okay? Awesome. Uh, session four, uh, when we get to session four, it's going to be about the historical and biblical view of the one world global ecclesiastical system, uh, religious system. In other words, it'll be about the one world religious system, how, how the end times is going to bring about a one world religious system. Um, session number six. I'm sorry, session number five, the historical and biblical view of the New World Order. And many of you have heard of maybe the New World Order. I'm not talking about the New World Order that you see on wrestling channels. Okay, this is something else. This is something totally different. They're just trying to use the terminology to spark interest in people's minds, but that's not what the New World Order is. The New World Order is going to be a global governance. It's going to be a one world governmental system. And the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, uh, brings this out and uh, in great imagery, and we're going to go through that a little bit later. Session six is going to be, How Close Are We? Prophetic Dating, Five Scriptural Directives Concerning Christ and His Return. Please don't tell anyone that we're going to give a date when Jesus is going to come back, or there's going to be this day. It's not going to happen in this class, I promise you. But these five scriptural directives concerning Christ's return, we're going to look at what the Bible does say. The Bible says that we won't know that anybody... Yeah. The day or the hour. But the Bible does not say that we won't know the season. In fact, it says we will know the season. Um, we're going to understand about the seasons more and through Scripture. There's going to be a season of time that's going to come to pass that people are like, the rapture is about to happen. And we're really, really, really close to it. And there's going to be lots of things that we can talk about in this class that we will talk about in this class that really allude to... A, a date, or a close to a date, or close to a year, or close to a season of time, but there's no, no man knows the day or the hour, and that's an impossibility that scripture, <clears throat> a blanket statement, no man knows it. Yep. And so we got to be careful whenever we try to uh, wrangle, the, wrangle the calendar to make it fit our needs, because there are lots and lots of mistakes in the calendar that we use. Uh, the Gregorian calendar has a four-year it's missing four years, in case you didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, there's also other times and seasons that have been moved and rearranged throughout the course of history. And not to mention that is that the Jewish calendar has all kinds of intricate details that swip and swap depending on where the moon is and all kinds of other things like that. Or whenever a priest decided to you know, know if it was the time of, the, of a Passover, they had all these visual identifications <coughs> that changed the course of time for the Jewish nation. And so no man knows the date of that. So we can only perceive the seasons, and we can only do that through the eyes of Scripture and light that shines from Scripture onto our reality. And 
and it has to shine into our heart for us to perceive those things as well. You understand what I'm saying? The Word of God is light, and it shines throughout all creation. It also shines into our heart, and so everything that light touches it is re revealed, right? So everything we see has been revealed to us by light today in this room, physically. Same way in Scripture. When Scripture shines upon a situation, it, it does nothing but reveal. In the same way, the Spirit that dwelt upon the face of the waters in, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, whenever it, it dwelled upon the face of the waters, it spoke, right? And then all of a sudden, things were, began to reveal. It became <coughs> evident there was things lurking under the water. And that's the same way it is with Revelations. There's more, there's, it's like an iceberg. You think you know something, but when you get close enough to the iceberg, you realize there's a whole lot more under the water than what you can perceive with your natural eyes. And uh, we try to make it fit our paradigm. The truth of the matter is, not as much as we would like to think, the uh, uh, United States and, and America, the Americas are not in Scripture as much as we would like to think from our perspective. We are just a small little player in, the, in a very big pond of revelation and understanding of, of what's going to happen in the end times. But we are part of the Gentile nation, so to speak. There are a, a number of Jews that are, are here in the United States. Um, but really, in the grand scheme of things, globally, and also throughout revelation and the, and the precepts and the principles that, that guide our understanding of revelation, the the hermeneutical laws, the things that would, would create a, a, a environment in which we could perceive something, we, we, we don't fall in there too many times. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get that out there in case you got it. Where's the United States? Where's the eagle? And where's all? I mean, we, we are a small portion of what, what of the world. Okay, so I think that I think Americans have. Uh, we think too much of ourselves sometimes. And the global, the global economy and the global the world right now, they don't like the United States as much as, as what they might have a few years ago. And our influence is, is dwindling faster and faster as time goes by. Hey, Pastor Hook. Okay. And so, uh, section six, we're going to talk about how close are we? Prophetic dating, five scriptural directives concerning Christ's return. Yes. And so, with that being said, that is a basic outline of the, of the class. Now, going into the book of Revelations, um, there's something, book of Revelation, there's something that we should look at first and primarily before we do anything else, and that's what John intended to say. John was, John was the apostle. He was probably in his 90s when he, when he wrote this book. And he wrote this book to the, to the seven churches around Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was not where he was from. Uh, John was a Jew, and Jew, Jews were from Israel, but Ephesus was far into, into Europe. It was closing in on, on, uh, on Italy and Greece. It's pretty far over there. And, the, and he wrote this book to those churches. Now, the churches have ar had already been dispersed out of Jerusalem. Um, we find that now, at this point in time, Antioch had pretty much had taken control of church governing. Um, where he used to go back to Jerusalem, there had been so much persecution that now the, the new hub for understanding, the new hub for leadership, the new hub for everything had moved from Jerusalem now to Antioch, which was a, a Gentile city. And the reason why that was is because the revelations, or the, uh, the prophecies had come true for Jerusalem, that, that basically that they would be scattered abroad. And does everyone understand how how did they disperse from Jerusalem because they were being persecuted? Did, does anybody? I'm just going to ask a couple questions because I have a, a few blanks here. But do you understand? How, basically, uh, the, in the in the New Testament, the Book of Acts basically tells the story of how this happened. Has anybody read through the entire Book of Acts in here? And so, basically, we the uh, brother Luke which was Paul's um, cohort, he was his, his, his personal writer, he wrote out a historical account of how every church started, including Ephesus, including all of his other churches along the way. And so Paul, Paul was this person he was writing about, and he was writing in defense, it was almost like a, a legal document. He was writing in Paul's defense of how he was not only an apostle, but how he had not committed any crimes against Rome. And so this document had a multifaceted effect 
uh, not only on the world, but also on the church. Well, if you read through the book of Acts, you see where these churches started. And it's very important for us to understand that this, these churches were, were, were missionary churches, okay? They were brand new works. They were not completely made up of devout Jews, okay? They were Gentile works in, a Gentile, in Gentile nations. And if you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is someone who wasn't a Jew, basically. They didn't believe necessarily all the Jewish precepts, but they were converted along the way. When Paul went on to his missionary journeys, he had, he had started these churches around Ephesus. And so we look at John's writing. John was a Jew, and he was, he was a devout Jew, and he had written this letter, one of his very last letters. You see, John's original writings, the, the book of John, and John, 1 John, 2 John, they were books of, really books of love, right? You read about it, it talks about God's love quite a bit. There's a revelation of, of God's love in, in the book of John, especially John 14, probably the biggest chapter of the love of God toward man. But this, but this book was like the flip side of what John had previously written. I mean, talk about an unexpected letter from John. This is the, but he calls it something interesting. He calls it, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, how many times have you gone to a church and you heard people say, God is? God is good. God is love. God is good. I mean, don't you hear that all the time. You see them bumper stickers and things like that. But you never, you never hear anyone say, God is severe. Or God is judge. Or God is, God is sovereign. You very rarely hear, somebody, maybe they might edge into the area of when God is sovereign. But they never want to say that God is the judge, or God is severe, or God, you know, people don't talk about that. They, they try to stray away from that. You have to attract brand new believers to a church congregation talking about how mean and how severe and how just and how, you know, righteous that God is. But the truth of the matter is this whole entire book of Revelation, this revelation of Jesus Christ, there's not a whole lot of good and, and pretty and fluffy yeah. about Jesus Christ in it. It really comes to, straight to the point. And uh, so we'll read it in chapters number one. We'll, let's just read chapter one through nine. Uh, Brother Kerry, do you have your Bible? I'd like for you to actually read that. <coughs> chapter one through nine. Chapter one, one through nine. Sorry. Not nine chapters, huh? Not nine chapters. <laughs> What, yeah, do you have it there? Yeah, I've got it, but I have a couple of different uh, versions. Are you talking about King James or New King James? New King James would be great. I, 
John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is the beginning of the book of Revelation. This is a, like I said, a letter written back to the churches. And the churches are identified in the next upcoming verses and chapters. Those churches are those seven churches that we spoke of earlier. But uh, we'll just go, we're going to stick to the pages here so we make sure we cover the material. If you look at the book of Revelation, it's a suggested outline of Revelation. We're still on page number one. We haven't even got to the lesson yet. But we're just kind of getting a, a, a foundation built of understanding here. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 9 is, is the book of the book is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which we already covered. This is a revelation of God manifest in flesh, the King of glory, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and there's none beside him. He's the King of glory. That's what this book is about. The author is John, who is identified as the brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Number three, a blessing is pronounced on them that read it and hear and keep the things that are written in the book. So thank you, Jesus, for the blessing that we're having today for studying the book of Revelation. Yeah. It is important, obviously, to God, or it would not be included in our Bible, but it also wouldn't have been spoken. Um, the, ver the very next few chapters are the only time in all of Scripture where Jesus Christ verbatim speaks something and it's recorded. Um, every other time is a paraphrase or what someone had remembered some many years off, but this was, this was written straight out of, the, out of, basically out of the mouth of God by John. He was literally standing in front of him when he was receiving this revelation. So it's a very unique part of Scripture. And so it's, there's a blessing that's pronounced on them that read it, hear it, and keep the things written in the book. So it is vitally important that we understand Revelation uh, for our personal understanding of what we should do in our in our lives, but also in the, in the church's future. And uh, we can look at how the people that were addressed in this book uh, represent not only church in our day and age, but throughout all of history. And we'll look at that in just a few minutes. Uh, number five, the identification of he who is, who was, and who is to come, first begotten of the dead, and prince of the kings of the earth, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number six, the identification of the church, loved by God, washed from our sins in his blood, and made kings and priests. Um, and number seven, Judgment to be expected at his return. Okay, this is where we start to hear about the judgment of God. This is a very unique concept to the people who had previously received letters from John in that first church. And so they're starting to see a revelation. There's no need for revelation if you already know something, right? And so the revelation was given to that first church. They needed to hear something new. And this was a brand new understanding of who Jesus Christ was. Uh, very interesting uh, when we read through all where all the churches were in their walk with God and how they had operated thus far, what God had required for them to make massive changes in their churches and also in their personal lives. You'll, we'll, we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Um, also, uh, number eight, the Apostle John, lo lo his location and the writing of the book is the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos was, a, was an island just off the coast of Greece, uh, kind of in the Mediterranean Sea, but not too far out there. Uh, very similar to an understanding of how we would uh, think of Alcatraz. It was a it was a, a prisoner island. The, the island was strictly for prisoners. It was really known for goats. Um, so goats and prisoners pretty much inhabited the entire island. And um, it was just far enough where people couldn't make the swim back to shore. So they'd drop them off out there. And leave them. So it was just this rocky and uninhabited island full of goats, and there wasn't much much to build from, and they drop off prisoners. Now John was obviously a prisoner. The history says that John was boiled in oil for his faith, and he didn't die in the oil. So they took him out of the, the boiling oil, and then they located him on the island of Patmos. And so that, that's the story. And so maybe the severity, an understanding of God's judgment, and there's something that persecution can make you see. Uh, have, have you ever, who's been here, who in here has been through a trial where you, you became exceedingly aware of spiritual realms? Okay, that's the easiest way I can say it. But you went through a test or a trial or a storm and you're like, Lord, I'm giving this all to you. And it's like, the devil doesn't, the devil never stops, amen? He never quits. But he also doesn't know when to stop. 
Sometimes he pushes a Christian too far. And whenever he pushes a Christian too far, a Christian's like, I can't do this anymore. It's not my strength. I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's at that point when Jesus Christ takes over. Amen. And you get things like this, the book of Revelation. And it's a very scary thing to fall in the hands of God, especially after a saint has been praying. Amen? So the key verse here is, Write the things that which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall hereafter. Revelation 119. So uh, this is the key verse of basically the entire start of Revelation. The very first few verses we read were an introduction, it was an explanation. But Revelation 119 sets up the entire uh, chronologic order of Revelation. And so we read through Revelation, we, we see ourselves confused oftentimes. We, we go and poke around in chapter 14, and we go back to chapter 8, and we're trying to figure out what wormwood is and this and that. Uh, but really, it's very simple, okay? Can anybody in here count to seven? Raise your hand if you can count to seven. Okay. If you can count to seven, you got 90% of it licked. <coughs> the other number that's really we find in here, the only other two numbers, is 144,000, which is an integer of however you say that of seven and 24 of elders. <coughs> and everything else is one, and that usually, if you take one, it's about one angel or one god. Amen. All right. And so we're going to go through this systematically, but Revelation 119 says, "Write the things which thou hast seen." Okay, everyone with me? Right. Write the things which you have seen. So he's saying everything that you know about John in the past, write it down real fast. And we kind of read through that a little bit. And then he says, and the things which are. So in other words, what, what has been, write, that, write about that real fast. But now write about what is happening right now. In those first three or four chapters, we read about the churches in their condition right now. In John's time, right then and there. And then the last thing he says in that verse is, and the things which are, I'm sorry, and the things which shall be there hereafter. In other words, it's a transition to the timeline. The timeline was write about everything that has, has occurred. Now write about the things that are happening right now. And then after that, I want you to write about everything that's going to happen in the future. And that's how the book of Revelation sets up. First John talks about the things that are, or that have happened, that, have, that has, thou hast seen. Then he talks about the things which are, and then he talks to things about the things that shall be hereafter, okay? And so the things which thou hast seen, John's vision of a glorified Christ and uh, king priest, amen? The things which are, he talks about the seven churches, some view as seven dispensational church ages, but we'll talk about that more in just a few minutes. He also talks about the seven candlesticks, which is a imagery, again, a, a Jewish mind thinks in imagery. They don't think alphanumeric. They don't categorize and they don't try to they don't try to put labels on everything. They, they just give you images and they try to let you decide what you think that is. And that happens quite a bit in this book. Um, <coughs> it talks about the seven candlesticks which represent churches. The glorified Christ in the midst of the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. And uh, we, some people would uh, translate that out to be pastors. The angels of the church, the pastors in many, time, in many, in many uh, translations. We don't necessarily know exactly who he's writing to. We just know that the, that the letter made it to the church, to those churches, okay? And that the, these letters were supposed to be read, read throughout all the churches. So the seven golden candlesticks represent the churches, the glorified Christ in the midst, and the seven stars and angels or messengers of the seven churches. Number two is how God sees the condition of his people. And so uh, has those first few chapters of Revelation. Uh, we can't do it in the class right now. But it talks about individual <laughs> judgments, what, how Christ judges that church. He literally says, you have done this and that's good, but you're doing this and it's bad. And this is what's going to happen if you do good, and this is what's going to happen if you do bad. That's the severity of Christ. It's not just all grace. It's not just all mercy. The truth of the matter is, His blood was already shed. Okay, These were already churches. They're supposed to be living for God. They're supposed to have already followed the plan of salvation that we find that people walked through uh, in the book of Acts. The only historical document the church has for salvation is the book of Acts. Okay, Gospels, Acts, and Epistles. The Gospels is the death, burial, resurrection, and life 
and all of that inclusive in, in Jesus Christ. And then he says, I shall give you power. In the book of Acts, it's the very last statements of the very first chapter of the book of Acts that says, I'm going to give you power in, in the future. And we read in chapter 2, in the only historical document, I'm going to keep saying this so you get it, the only historical document that the church has where people experience salvation and they become part of the church. The book, the church did not start in Matthew, didn't start in Mark, didn't start in Luke, didn't start in John. It started in the book of Acts. And it start, didn't start in chapter 1 either. It started in chapter 2. When the Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost and filled the believers, that was what's been prophesied from day one of all the way through all of all of the prophets. When there was God filled this, the believers with the Spirit of God, and also the apostles, and also Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. All of these people were there, and they received this gift that they had been hearing all about for three and a half years. They finally had received the gift. That's when the church has started. And that, that historical document goes through every account of how people are, are saved in the book of Acts. And they're saved into the church. And it starts in Jerusalem, and it goes to Samaria, and then to Judea, and then to every other uttermost part of the earth, which includes the United States, and it includes Wisconsin, and it includes Waukesha. We're still trying to get the gospel out there as far as Peter had first prophesied 2,000 years ago. It still hasn't reached the furthest point yet. But it started in Jerusalem, and then it went to, it went to Samaria and Judea, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And all of these churches that we find along the way, they start listing them out. And these are some of the churches that are written to in Revelation. Okay, These are churches that were saved according to the same gospel. It did not change. The same way they got saved in Acts chapter 2 was the same way they got saved in Acts chapter 8 and 9 and 19. It was all the same method. Nothing changed. And so a template was set in Scripture. And it wasn't just set in Scripture, but it was set... From the, from the very get-go, they did exactly what Jesus had commanded them to do. Go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, and it says you're going to teach every single nation. I'm, I'm using that scripture because it says you're going to teach every single nation. And we know that whenever they actually did what Jesus had told them to do in the book of Acts, they baptized them in the name of Jesus every single time. So they were fulfilling Matthew 28, 19, it literally, by baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you want, that's not part of this Revelation series, but if you want to ask more questions about that, we can do that when we turn the tape off. Okay, we got a little sidetracked there. Um, the things which shall be hereafter, okay? That's, we'll just go ahead and jump to the things which shall be hereafter. We're talking about the rapture of the church, all right? Does anybody understand the term rapture? If you don't know what rapture means, please raise your hand. Okay. The rapture of the church is a terminology that we use uh, to define whenever God comes and takes his bride, the bride of Christ, from the earth and into heaven with him. Um, so, do you understand that? Okay. I need to slow down. Um, the rapture, the rapture is a is a day. Uh, the Bible says that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound, okay, and it's going to be blown from an angel's from the lips of an angel, and a trumpet's going to sound. And then when that trumpet sounds, it's going to be a very spiritual event at all at one time across the world, simultaneously. Every single person who is saved and their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They are going to be raptured and with it. it. Means is their body is literally going to be in. A, it says in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen so fast. <laughs> their body is just going to be gone. So basically, it'd be like if the rapture happened right now, the trumpet sound. You you would hear the trumpet sound, and if Curtis was going to be saved, Curtis would not be there, but his clothes would be sitting there, and Curtis would not only his body would change into a glorious body that was a heavenly body. And also, Curtis, would, his garments would be changed from his drabby old gray t-shirt to a white robe. <laughs> and that's going to happen. It's going to be an event that's going to be global. It's going to be simultaneous. It's going to happen. And that's when Jesus comes back for his bride. And so these concepts, are we'll get more and more into it. But the bride of Christ is a key concept, and the rapture is a key concept. The bride of Christ is simply the church as a whole. 
So every person that is saved and their, land, their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they've been saved according to the gospel uh, that was given to the apostles and how they preached it in the book of Acts. If they're saved that same way, they're part of the church. And if they live their life according to what all the apostles asked for them to do uh, in all of the epistles, then they consider themselves saved. If they're saved, they are part of the bride of Christ, which is imagery, uh, again, from a Jewish perspective. Um, I better slow down. Just, just, I'll slow down just for a minute. Okay, whenever someone gets married in the United States, what happens? Start to finish. They become engaged. They get an engagement, right? So if someone's engaged, right, they get usually a ring, a token, right? <laughs> so a token of engagement. And then uh, something happens. They kind of plan out a wedding, right? They set up household, and then they uh, then they set a date, and at that time, the date they get married, right? There's a, usually a legal document that's signed. anybody been married before? Signed the document before? That document is signed, and then they are now husband and wife. The wife takes on the name of the husband, correct? Usually, uh, that's starting to change a little bit in the United States. <laughs> But they take on a name and then they live happily ever after, quote unquote, in the household they set up, right? Well, in Jewish customs 2,000 years ago, it was slightly different. They still had an engagement, but the process was a little different. Um, it was set up like this. Um, if I wanted to uh, marry Janet, and Janet was single, and I was single, and I wanted to marry Janet, I wanted to, I'd still have to engage you, right? And so in order to engage you in that custom, in that day and age, I would come to you and, and I, would, uh, I would say, I want to, I, from this point on, me and you are engaged. And then I would go ahead and put the ring on your finger right then as a token of the future engagement. Okay, so you'd have a token of that engagement. Not only that, now this is what really starts to get weird, is in that day and age, then that dude would leave, okay, and he wouldn't be seen again until the marriage day. And you want to know what he was doing? He's setting up household. But in this day and age, you go get a house loan, and you go buy a house, or you go pay your rent your first month, and then you move all your stuff over there. Well, in that day and age, they didn't have rent, and they didn't have stuff like that. So the dude had to go and build a house. Okay, so the guy would leave, and he's, they would usually, because usually carpenters had carpenter sons and things like that. And so whoever your dad was, that's what you, your business was, and family tradition went on and on. And not only that, but God would give every single Jew their own land, and their land had to be in a certain area. And so in their certain area, they had to build their own house in their area. And so they literally would separate out into tribes and into small families. So they literally would actually, instead of just wasting land and waste, wasting materials, they'd literally build their house onto their father's house. They'd just build on extra rooms. And so it, it would literally be room, 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 and it would just go on by family generation. It would just it'd be a large, large house. And so he would go and build a house, and then whenever he was done, he would come back for his bride. The bride never knew the day or the hour. So if the bride never knew the day or the hour, she had to stay ready at all times. So she put on her wedding garment, she put on her token of that wedding, and at all times, after she was engaged, she stayed ready. And at, interestingly enough, at that moment that she was engaged, she, did, she no longer had her own name, but she took on the name of her future husband. Even if they weren't completely married yet. Okay, That's the differences that we see in our, our day and age. Um, and so we see this really uh, very easily, we see this whenever... Mary was a spouse to Joseph, a spouse. She literally had Joseph's name, even though they weren't married. He had not set up household completely for her. And then she became pregnant of the Holy Ghost, <coughs> immaculate conception, and she came to him saying, well, not only that, all the angels let him know, and he was still freaking out a little bit. But, um, so he would already, everyone knew that they were going to be married. She had already had his name, and so he was going to put her away privately. Now, in this day and age, he's like, give me my ring back. But um, in that day and age, that was a big deal because she was technically already married, even though they had not consummated the marriage, so to speak. 
No, they didn't have a marriage day. So she had to stay ready at all times. Okay, here's the imagery. We are the bride of Christ, okay? I'm just saying, I'm, I'm kind of deviating from my notes so people can get the concept. We're the bride of Christ. We are that bride. At the point that we receive the Spirit of God, we receive a token of what things are to come. So when we feel the Spirit of God, we feel what heaven will be like. Okay? It's, a, it's like an engagement ring. Okay? And not only that, we're made completely clean and holy from all of our unrighteousness and sin through the repentance, remission of sin through His name. Now, get this. Through His name. Whenever you take on the name of the spouse, right. then you have the right to wear the ring and you have a right to wear the garment. But you don't take on the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have those rights. Okay? It's like showing up to a wedding without a wedding garment. And we read in parable that where someone does that, and that's not a very good thing to do, because they didn't have a good outcome. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of times we do take out all the severity of to read the parables. There is a lot of severity of God. Almost every single one of them has a positive outcome for people that are obedient and a negative outcome for people that are disobedient. And almost every single time, someone's ended up wailing and gnashing teeth and hellfire brimstone and asking for a drop of water. I don't see how this church in this modern day, this Laodicean church of the day that we live in, has taken all the severity of God out of Scripture. But the truth of the matter is they have. Um, we're going back to the illustration that I took the time out. We are the bride of Christ. We are not completely at the marriage supper of the Lamb yet. We're not there yet. In fact, our husband, Jesus Christ, has not come back for his bride yet. But he said in John chapter 14, he says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And so we know where he is. And so it's our responsibility as the bride to stay ready for a wedding day, to be ready for the trumpet to sound, to be ready to be raptured, to be taken away into a place prepared for us. And so we keep the ring on, which is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost living in our lives. And we keep our, our garments spotless and, and without spot or wrinkle. That's what those scriptures mean. We're trying to, we try to keep ourselves holy and pure from the world and ready. Wouldn't it be a, a sad situation to have Jesus Christ come back and uh, you're out with another man. <laughs> or you're just having a nasty house and not ready to get married and your hair is ratty. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just so you get the illustration. God is expecting us to be ready when He comes back. And so I wanted to stop and take that time for understanding the rapture. Is the camera still working? It's okay. Okay. Um, so the things that... Sh which shall be hereafter. Number three, the rapture of the church. Uh, so right here in this, uh, in these chapters, chapter number four, verse five, John is caught up. The Lamb is uh, takes his throne. The church is seen, uh, seated with Jesus Christ. And we'll go through this a little bit uh, more in depth uh, as we go through lessons. But I'm just kind of giving an overview of all the revelations right now. Um, the church is seen, seated with Jesus Christ in his throne and identified by John. The tribulation six through nine, uh, uh, six through nineteen. These are chapters. Okay, the rapture of the church is chapter four through five. The tribulation is chapter six through nineteen of Revelation. The three series of judgments: the beast, the interim happening, and uh, the first part of tribulation is six through nine. The middle part of tribulation is ten through fourteen in the Antichrist kingdom. The last part of tribulation is fifteen through nineteen, where the harlot woman identified is identified in her destruction foretold. Babylon is destroyed in the great battle of Armageddon and the end of the Antichrist. Okay, these are all elements that we'll bring into a little bit later in our teaching that you'll understand uh, more fully in case you have questions on some of those, those things. Uh, C is the millennial kingdom of Christ. Uh, is chapter number 20 is where Satan is bound a thousand years. And D is the new heavens and the new earth. And so, if you'll flip on the back, the go back page Golden Nuggets, I'm going to try to rush through this as fast as I can. Uh, to, refer to, uh, to refer to it as a revelation declares that it is something hidden before it 
before now and it's been brought to light. Amen? So the churches that received this letter, was they weren't aware that Jesus was so severe. They didn't have any idea of all this stuff that John's talking about. This was the first time they had heard about it. John was 95. The church had been going for like seven <laughs> years. And so this was a brand new revelation to many of the first time believers, especially the Jews. They had no concept of all of these things, but it really started to take all of the scripture and all of history that the Jews knew uh, talking about all the minor prophets and major prophets in the Old Testament, including some of Moses' writings, and took them and merged them all together and said, oh, now we understand that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of this prophecy. And so we read here, uh, here's the key to the entire book of Re Re Revelations. If you follow the basic outline and develop the chapters and se sequence mentioned in Revelation 1, you will find that the cro chronolo uh, chronology is easily observable so that the book of Revelation need be no great mystery. Okay, so there's not a great mystery in the chrono chronology of the book. It talks about the things that are past, the things that happen now, and what's going to happen in the future. So there's really not a whole lot of mystery there. What's mysterious about the book is how John illustrated the concepts of Revelation, and we're going to get deeper into that and further on down the road. So three things. Things which ha you have seen, Revelation 1, 1 through 18. Re things which are, Revelation 2 and 3. And uh, chapters 2 and 3, and things which shall be hereafter, Revelations 4, all the way through 22. These are the things that had not happened yet. So the outline Pat is John's vision on Patmos, uh, island of Patmos. Number, uh, chapter 2 is the rebuke of the four, ch of four of the churches. The, chapter number 3 is the other three churches rebuke. Chapter number 4 is a picture of God's throne. Chapter number five is the Holy Lamb is worship. Chapter number six is each seal is broken. Chapter number seven is the crowd coming uh, from tribulation. Chapter number eight is the yoke of four trumpets. Chapter number nine is the abyss releases more trumpets. Chapter number 10 is the book is eaten by John. Chapter number 11 is opposition to two witnesses. Chapter number 12 is unrelenting opposition of, dra of the dragon. Chapter number three is tattoo of world order or world ruler. I, some people say it's going to be a tattoo. I think that the it's going to it's going to be a mark. Tattoo is the best terminology that we have right now. Um, time, chapter number fourteen. Time is ripe for harvest. Chapter number fifteen is harping uh, Moses and the Lamb. Chapter number sixteen is emptying of the bowls or the vials. Chapter number seventeen is the future destruction of heart of the harlot. Chapter number eighteen is utter destruction of Babylon. Chapter number nineteen is the triumph. Feast of Christ. Chapter number 20 is the ultimate resurrection and judgment. Chapter 21 is revelation of the new Jerusalem. Chapter 22 is the eternal, eternal city and light. Notice that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the confusion of Christ. If you have followed the prophecy through Old Testament, this book is very simple. Okay. But what makes Revelation so confusing is a lot of people want to skip all those lengthy, you know, 60 chapters of Isaiah and all trying to figure out what Daniel's talking about. If you understand all of the prophecy throughout the course of time, <coughs> Revelation is the capstone of all of that prophecy, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which really completes every prophetic honor it's ever made. Jesus Christ is the type, is the anti-type of every type that ever was in the end of all that he's done, and we'll get more into that later on. So, everyone got a good grasp of uh, Revelation? Yeah. Just the basic outline? Let's we'll stop the tape for a minute. Are you good? Alright. Um, I, I realize, uh, probably to make things easier, I'm going to skip forward uh, to something more visual. And then we'll go back to the notes, okay? But I'm going to just talk about a biblical timeline. Um, and so, let's let's do something here. Just for fun, uh, I don't know how many Bible scholars that we have in the room, or who considers themselves well-versed in, uh, in Scripture. But let's just consider this line right here, the timeline of all, all eternity, okay? Is that cool? I'm going to write this as fast as I can. But someone... Tell me, let's talk about things that you know, how how the Bible sets up, or how things transpire chronologically. In the beginning. And the beginning is God. So, so this could be, <coughs> what is that thing up there? In, in the beginning would be Genesis, right? Yep. Sarah, will you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. I'm going to 
have you draw this out. Her handwriting is just immaculate. We put it in Genesis. <coughs> if we, if they're books of the Bible, um, if they're books of the Bible, just draw them real small, and then we just chronologically place them above. If they're characters of the Bible, they mention characters, just put them below. And if there are anything else that goes beyond a character reference or a biblical reference, then we'll, we'll write them in above or beyond it. Okay. And so, anybody else know what's happening in Genesis chronologically? So we got the garden. So, and we just got to. Does anybody know the garden, of, the whole entire creation process in, in Genesis, right? Yeah, it's not. It's really small. But let's just put in. It's, we're gonna have to keep it small because this is a big. Big outline. So just put in Adam and Eve uh, as characters in Genesis, okay? Is that, we'll, 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 we're not going to go exact. We're just going to kind of hit the highlights, okay? So what was the very next major thing that happened? No water? Water. The flood. <coughs> so you want to write in there. It's still in Genesis. Just write in the flood, but try to just put in Noah. Uh, put it. Yeah, you can put it right here. That's fine. Noah. What's the very next major event? What what happened right before that? Tower of Babel, right? Tower of Babel. So that would probably be a major event. So what would be after Noah, what do you think was the next major event? Cain and Abel. That was before. Sorry, don't forget you're on recording. Um, so anyone else uh, after Noah? Someone help me out. Genesis. Abraham? Abraham. That's pretty much the next major event, right? Abraham, Genesis chapter 14, 15, on there, 12. So you want to write in there Abraham? Okay. And so we know that... Well, the, uh, sending his son to... I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so let's go... What's that right in there? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Jacob was a unique son who was didn't get to stay with the family. And so <coughs> after his adolescence, he was taken out somewhere, right? To, you want to help me out? No. Jacob? I'm talking about Jacob. Jacob. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. What happened to Jacob? Jacob's ladder. Okay. okay. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Alright, awesome. Jacob's name changed to Israel. And so we realize that now all of a sudden the people that the God had given a promise to Abraham and that he said that his seed would have would be as plentiful as the sand on the seashore, right? It would be unnumerable, basically. And that not only that, that whenever Jacob came along, his, he was really a deceiver and someone who was not very, you know, he didn't make every every perfect moral decision, so to speak, and moral, moral, moral character was kind of off on one side. Well, God renamed him Israel. And from that point on, the people were, were from the same lineage, the same bloodline. They were named Israel basically Israel, okay? And so that's where we get the terminology of, for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is basically of the same bloodline of Abraham, but along the chronological order, it became known as Israel being the name of Jacob when God renamed him Israel, which means Prince, prince of God, I think, or Prince of God. Um, and so Jacob, Jacob is renamed Israel, and we start to see all of these promises on that God has given to, to Abraham's seed, right? So Jacob has uh, lots of sons. We're only going to name the ones that uh, matter. Joseph. Joseph is the one that we really want to focus on. Joseph was the one, and I kind of got my, my, ahead of myself, but Joseph was the son of Jacob that all of the other brothers hated. He wore the coat of many colors. He was cast into a pit, and they were going to kill him, but they decided not to kill him. They sold him into slavery. And so an Egyptian, uh, he was sold into an Egyptian household. That household made him basically the lord of the entire house. His name was Potiphar. Potiphar's wife decided that she liked uh, the way Joseph looked and wanted to have a relationship with Joseph. And Joseph's in his own heart, because he had not the law yet, in his own morals, his own character. He didn't have anything else to go by. There wasn't any written law or anything. But in his own heart, and his own character, he decided that's not something I want to do. I don't want to sin. Be sin I don't want to sin before my God. I don't want to, you know, cause any anything like that in my life. And so, literally, she ran away from him, and uh, or he ran away from her, and she grabbed his coat and ripped it off of him. And so he just kept running, and she accused him of rape. Well, he got cast into prison, right? Does anybody know the story? 
So he got cast into prison, and there's a baker and a butler, blah, blah, blah. Things happen, and he basically becomes this person who, uh, through all this turmoil and trials, remember when we talked about the turmoil and trials all of a sudden create this weird spiritual environment for our lives that we can all of a sudden see things we wouldn't understand normally? This happens throughout Scripture. It's a scriptural principle. The more that you get hammered, it seems like the more spiritual things also are revealed. Uh, it's kind of interesting. But anyway, he starts getting hammered. He starts realizing he can interpret dreams. He had already interpreted his own dreams. He had this dream that all of his brothers would bow down to him and worship him, which no one really quite understood at that moment. And they got mad about it, all of his brothers, and that's pretty much why they wanted to kill him. But what happened was Joseph was, uh, <coughs> Joseph was cast in this prison, and for years he got stuck in this prison. And then one day the king, of the pharaoh of all of Egypt, decided... Uh, he had a dream, and nobody could interpret it. He hired all the crazy soothsayers and all the magicians and everyone to come and try to figure out what his crazy dream was about. Well, the butler had gotten out of jail. With, I get it right. The butler and the baker, one of them got killed, and Joseph prophesied it. The other one got out. And he was supposed to tell the king, uh, Pharaoh, to let him out, but he didn't let him out. I'm going through the story really fast, okay? This is an important story, but... Basically what happened is finally this guy, oh yeah, I remember this guy in jail. He can re interpret dreams. And they go back and they get him out. And they get him out of jail. They shave him up, get him nice and cleaned up, bring him before Pharaoh. And he literally interprets the dream to such a degree and to such effectiveness that Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, you're in charge of all of this. He said, I believe what you're saying, but now I'm going to put you second in command of all of Egypt. So he went literally from the dungeon all the way to second in command in, in a matter of just a few hours. And not, so Joseph had this weird ability to be blessed with very much anything he did. So he went through the kingdom and he started setting up this plan so that the kingdom wouldn't go through the famine, which was what the dream was about. And so he put up seven years with the corn. They didn't die. They didn't, they didn't pass away. What happens is in the middle of the famine, all of Joseph's brothers are about to starve to death. And they literally come dragging themselves to Egypt to try to beg, basically, for food. What they didn't know, they were coming right before Joseph's presence, and we're going to have to basically ask him to give them food so they didn't all starve to death. Well, Joseph, through a number of different interactions, if you haven't read the Bible, or through the story, he literally kind of lets them off the hook. But he, in doing so, he makes sure that they go back and get his dad because he wanted to see his dad. And he also wanted to see his, his youngest brother, which was... I won't we'll go through all the story, but it was his brother that what he hadn't seen in a very long time. He missed his dad. He missed his, his real brother, his closest brother. He brought him. He brought him close by, and then that's how we get all of Israel, all of the children of Israel, through through uh, through Joseph. Joseph brings them all close to Egypt because he has the power to do so, and they started living in this land of Goshen, I believe is the term, and so that. It's all good. It's all fine and dandy. You know, just was second in command. Everything's cool, right? Well, what happens next? Someone help me out. I'm Moses. telling the story. Too much story. Moses. Moses. Okay, well, why was... What happened with Moses and why was Moses... What was going on with Moses? Someone tell me. Anybody know the story of Moses? Just the basic nutshell version? It's going to get more revelation in just a minute. I just want to set up a basic understanding of biblical... I want to know that you guys know at least that... At least that, that story that I told you. You guys believe everything I said so far? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Because uh, if you haven't read it, you're just going to have to take my word for it. That's unfortunate. Arkansas. You like the Razorbacks? I have a friend that's from it. Oh, man. <laughs> well, he, 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 was, uh, he was something about a flock, and he saw the Mount Zion, and he eventually, God told him to go up to a mountain. And so he went up that mountain, and the Ten Commandments started. And the bush. He has the highlights. <laughs> okay. I, everything was right. You just missed a bunch of stuff in the middle, which is fine. For our purposes, basically, uh, a pharaoh had risen. In other words, another pharaoh had come along. This is years and years down the road. Joseph's dead. They're all a brand new generation of people. A new pharaoh came and they're like, they made the Israelites, the children of Israel, Joseph's children and everyone else's children, slaves. And so slowly but surely they started making them slaves. And so now it's not Joseph's not second in command. A Pharaoh arose that knew not Joseph, that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And and basically they made all of the Israelites slaves. And so they went from living pretty cush 
to make making mud bricks all day long and uh, getting beat. And basically, what happens is not only that, but secondarily, not only are the slaves, but they're like, man, we're scared of all these Israelites. They're going to rise up and take over our entire nation. There's so many of them. They're so strong, and they have children like rabbits. So we're going to have to do something to slow down this population. They started the, one of the first types of population control that we've ever heard of. They would literally took all the baby Israelites, and they, when they had the baby, they take the baby and they would throw it into the Nile River to for an offering to their gods. And so this is this is widely known throughout all the historical documents that this is what was happening to the Israelites at that time. And so people are freaking out. They're not having kids as much, obviously, because they just get tossed in the river. And so one lady has a child, and his name's the child Moses. And she literally decides, well, I'm not going to throw the child in the water myself. I'm not going to let anybody else do it. What I'll do, I'll just make me a floating basket in that basket, and I'll send him down the river. And what God does with Moses, I'll let God be the judge, and I'll let God be in control. And so she literally places her, God, her faith in God, and she puts Moses in a basket and puts him down the river and kind of just walks away because she don't know what else to do. Well, just so happened that the princess of Egypt is out in the Nile doing her thing, whatever she's doing in the water, and all of a sudden Moses just comes floating up. So she takes Moses out of the basket and takes him home, like, kind of like a, kind of like you found a puppy out, out <laughs> at the lake. But at that time, that baby did not have a name. The name of the baby Moses. You're right. Mm-hmm. So through all of that, throughout all of that time, here is Moses, all right? And uh, Moses grows up in the prince, the princess's household, and basically Pharaoh is like his step, right? And so Pharaoh is is Moses' stepdad. Moses rises up, he's a great, cool dude, and everything's going good, he's educated, he's very smart, he does all this cool stuff, but all of a sudden he's starting to realize that this whole time that he was being raised, there was this lady that was speaking this stuff into his life. Just so happens that the lady that was his nurse, that they hired to be his nurse, was his actual mother. Yeah. And so the whole time that Moses is being raised, she's saying, "There's here all Israel, the Lord, I got his one Lord. <laughs> you need to know about, and she starts putting the heritage of the Israelite nation into him. Uh, and so he, he, he began, he, he realized that he was an Israelite, and he realized that he needed to do something about it, so he took matters into his own hands one day, and he went out and he seen one of the Egyptians beating one of his own cousins, beating another Israelite, just overbearing, you know, and he goes out and he just literally kills him, right? He just kills him. Not only does he kill him, he's so mad he just buries him under the sand. They leave a little toe sticking out and they find it, they figure it out. So Moses runs for his life. Because he knows that Pharaoh, his his own stepfather, is going to kill him now. And so Moses is like, I'm done with this, I'm out of here, and he runs out into the desert. And for forty years Moses hides in the desert, on the backside of the desert, it says. And in that time, we don't really know a whole lot to happen. I guess he had children, he married up, just had like a normal little life, kind of was no big deal. And then one day Moses is basically drawn up a mountain. I'm getting I'm getting somewhere. Okay. It's about revelation, I promise. He's drawn up a mountain, kinda of in the spiritual realm, so to speak, and he literally comes upon a burning bush. Does anybody know about the burning bush? Yeah. And the burning bush speaks to Moses all kinds of cool stuff. What it basically does is sets him up to go back to Israel, and to go back to Egypt, I mean, to go back to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And so he goes back, he does what God says, there's a bunch of reasons why he didn't like it, didn't want to, he didn't think he's good enough, all kinds of problems, but he ended up doing it. <coughs> when he got there, he got there, and uh, Moses was like, no, I'm going to do it. He, Moses, uh, uh, Pharaoh was like on and on, on and off, on and off about letting him go. So it, sometimes he's on, sometimes he's off. Every time the Pharaoh was off about it, God smoked the entire nation with a plague. So literally this happened ten times. But the very last plague is the most significant plague for what we're talking about. Because in the very last plague, Moses starts to institute things into the culture of the Israelite nation. All of a sudden God says, today is going to be the very first day of your calendar year. Boom. And on this certain day, I think the 15th day of Nisan or Nisan or something like that, he's going to institute something called the Passover. And the Passover was 
going to be whenever, whenever this last plague hit, it was going to be a bad one. Because basically the firstborn of every single living, breathing creature in all of Israel died. Mm -hmm. And except for those people that were in covenant with God and had done in obedience to God's word what God had asked him to do. And he literally went out and they killed a lamb and they, they put blood on the doorposts, right? And then they, they ate the lamb. And then at that night, whenever God told them to hide, they hid in their houses and he wouldn't let anybody out because that was the night of judgment. The judgment that God came upon all of Egypt and anyone who wasn't covered in that blood, they were they lost their firstborn child. The whole entire nation. That's the severity of God. It wasn't that it was the very first time it had happened because that was like number 10 of times that they had rebelled against what God was trying to do. So in that, all of a sudden, Moses became more, more than just a prophetic leader, but he became a governmental leader as well. He began to institute laws. He began to institute calendar years. He began to institute all these things. And so Moses became the, 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 the patriarch of law that we understand of organiz, organization of Israel, organization of tribes, organization of all this stuff. And so we can write in there that the next thing that happens is, is Moses. That's a massive thing. Now, Moses happens, right? And what, what is the whole purpose of what Moses is there for? To come back to Egypt? Free his people. Free his people. And so the freedom was simply what God had already promised Abraham. I already got you this big huge promise. The promise is already out there. It's just that your people aren't living up to the standard of the promise. They're not in the right place. They're not in the right time frame. They're not with me. They don't know who I am anymore. All these problems. So Moses real, literally... Not only he go back to try to save his people, but he tried to really try to pull them out of the Egyptian culture and try to reestablish them in the culture that God had intended them. Mm -hmm. The original culture that God had intended for all of Egypt, or I'm sorry, for all of Israel, is that every single family would govern its own self, that every single family would have a man of the house, and he would be the priest of every of, of his own home, and that they would all basically be sort of prophetic in a way where they could listen to God, they'd hear what God's voice was for their personal family, and they were supposed to do this thing. And Well, basically, they were only three days outside of getting out of Egypt, because after that tenth plague happened, uh, they, Pharaoh said, get out of here. I don't want you here no more. And so they began to leave, and then all of a sudden, Pharaoh changed his mind again, because he's kind of like that. Well, Pharaoh chases after him and literally, they run into a dead end to the water, right? They don't have nowhere to go. And so God tells Moses to raise up your staff. And literally, the waters of the Red Sea parted. And they walked across where there used to be water on dry ground. So they got halfway across. And they got all their people across, millions of people at one time. Massive miracle. And then all of a sudden, when they were the Pharaoh's army, they started to come across. Then the waters came down and drowned them. And so we got these people that they're on their way to a promised land, but they're not quite there yet. You would think that that's the end of the story, but it really isn't. They hadn't crossed the Jordan River. They hadn't got to where they needed to be yet. And so for 40 years, what should have took, what should have took the children of Israel with all these miracles, and <laughs> they had basketfuls of miracles every day, but they literally took 40 years because of their mentality to cross from that miracle at the Red Sea to the Jordan River. So they literally, a whole entire generation of people had to die out because they could not grasp the concept that God just literally wanted them in a better place. Yeah. Nothing more than that. They wanted to live like Egypt. They wanted to live in sin. They wanted to have their own way. They wanted to, all this stupid stuff that Egypt did and instilled in them. It took an entire generation to die out before God <coughs> was able to actually work with the people that they wanted to do. And so when that happened, they what happened is they got right up to the line of that river for the last little thing. They finally, 40 years, and Moses is standing there, an old, 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 old man, because he already his first 40 years was somewhere in Egypt. His second 40 years, he was uh, out in the desert. And his last 40 years was wandering, wandering all through the wilderness. The dude was 120 years old by this time. He's an old, old man. 
And so he literally gets right to the line where he's trying to get the people, and he does not make it himself. God takes it. And so the very next person who steps on the scene is Joshua. Joshua then takes over leadership, and then we start to see a transition. Okay, and I'm going to start rushing through this because that's the basics of the start. Okay, so basically, so we'll start naming off some more characters of the Bible, major characters after Joshua, <clears throat> or major events. Anybody? Okay. Um, well, the next major event was Joshua gets them through, and they start conquering land. They start taking over what God had promised them. And the very next major event is that there's this massive roller coaster period in the time and the lives of all the people because they can't figure out how to really get a hold of what God is trying to get them to do. So they're up and down, up and down. Anybody ever know a Christian who was up and down? <laughs> up and down, up and down, up and down. And the Bible says they literally, uh, they did what was right in their own eyes, which is a big time problem because people make lots of stupid mistakes. Have ever, ever, anybody ever heard of the X factor? The X factor is the human factor, like... Well, this is what's supposed to happen, but when you put times it by X, this is probably what's going to be something else. Well, if you, every decision you make is right in your own eyes, you're going to have a lot of X factor. You're going to make a lot of stupid mistakes. Anybody make a lot of stupid mistakes in your life? Son. So the X factor happens, and they're like, literally, they're like, well, let's do this. Let's get together and let's get judges and have them judge the people and try to take care of all these stupid disputes and little problems that we're having. And so this roller coaster period of judges, let's just write judges in there, right here. It's actually a book, Numbers, Judges. Um, and so this happens, and it's not working out, okay? There's lots of problems. Stupid judges like Samson, anybody here ever hear of Samson? Mm -hmm. Samson was a judge of Israel, but he made all of his own stupid decisions. So uh, obviously not too great of a judge. Well, this kept happening, recurring, 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 over and over, and they're like, okay, well, we tried the judges, now what? let's try something different. Kings. So they tried kings. Okay, does anybody know the first king of Israel? Uh, Saul. 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 Saul was chosen to be the first king of Israel. Okay. Taking too long here. David. 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 Saul. David. David was the next king. He wasn't. The understanding was that kings were supposed to start it. They kind of took their model of what a king should be based on other kingdoms around them. They're like, oh, every king has a son. The king will grow up to be a prince. And it was like in England nowadays, the king will, the prince will eventually be the king, right? But that didn't happen. The very first king that came in, he was the king of Saul was the king, but he, he was so stupid he started doing all this stupid stuff and he ended up getting him and his own son killed. And uh, not only that, it was kind of prophesied that God, God was already going to do something because Saul was making these stupid decisions. So he literally rose up David and David became the king of Israel. And then the bloodline started, okay? And so this is very this is something that's very significant to prophecy, because a lot of prophecy, now the reason why I did all this. It's a long story, right? When I got to David, a lot of prophecy has a focal point. Okay, it's prophecy to Abraham. All right, there's a bunch of prophecy that is specifically to Abraham. It's not to us. It's not to Gentiles even. It's only to the children of Israel. It's only to the seed of Abraham. Okay, that's a type of prophecy. People get this stuff mixed up all the time. They get themselves all wacko, crazy, and doing weird, making weird decisions with what they think scripture means. And when they take a scripture out of context, they're saying, "Oh, I want this one to be my prophecy." Well, it's, no, it's for Abraham. It's for the children of Israel. It's not you. You're not a Jew. You're, you're not in the bloodline. It's not for you. It's for Abraham, and that's an eternal promise for Abraham, but not for you. Okay. When we get further into Revelation, we're going to start seeing the capstone take place, where not only we see the scripture fulfilled for Abraham. And all of his prophecies fulfilled, but also the prophecies that were referred to for David. Because all of a sudden David came on the scene, he began to institute things that were like sincere worship. He began to reestablish a kingdom. And not only that, he took and he he started he started the groundwork for building a temple, which started a whole other framework of things. And not only that, even though God didn't necessarily want, just like he didn't want a kingdom of priests. In, the, in Moses' time, but it was instituted by law because people wouldn't run their own house. He also didn't want a kingdom that was run by a king. He wanted to be the, their god and talk straight to him, but they wouldn't have it, so they had to institute kings. And, but in the midst of that, even though God didn't necessarily want it, just like he blessed uh, Moses and all that he wanted them to do, he tried to institute law to govern people 
that rules don't always work, especially, I mean, they just don't. I mean, when you have to institute rules, you already got problems. Okay, so by the time that you're instituting rules and laws, you already got issues. That's the reason why you have rules and laws. <coughs> David also received a lot of prophecy, and the, the prophecies that David received are also fulfilled in the book of Revelation. They're also fulfilled uh, in the end times. So David's prophecies are a whole other category of prophecies that aren't necessarily ours. They're David's prophecies. So we got Abraham's prophecies, and we got David's prophecies. We also have prophecies that were all the way back to this very first part of Genesis that were given to Adam and Eve. They said, this is going to happen if you do such and such. It was a prophecy given to them that if they did such and such, this is going to happen. And so, I'm doing all of this. Oh, man, that's a long story. I thought you guys were going to help me write it. Uh, I'm doing all this to try to show you the differences in time frames whenever prophecies, <coughs> whenever, what they're, who they're meant for, okay? Uh, this is an in-depth class, so you stick with me. I hope you're going to stick with me. So, what happened after the kings? Did anybody help me out? David and Goliath? David and Goliath was part of the kings. It happened in time of David's life. Then Solomon rose up, and then Solomon had two sons, and uh, they literally fought it out, and they split the kingdom of Israel. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Anybody remember that story? No? Um, okay. It's going to be tough. <laughs> we're going to write that in here. Rehoboam and Jeroboam split off of here. Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they split the kingdom. They split the kingdom. Has anybody heard of the, the kingdom of Judah before? Yeah. Okay, so. Judah and Israel. So it's like this. It's like Israel is supposed to be in one kingdom. Well, people are stupid. And they got mad at each other, so they decided to split. So they split like this. Uh, it's fine. Just get close. That's actually okay, great. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So these two sons, they decide, well, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start my part of the kingdom. You start your part of the kingdom. You go to the north, I'll go to the south. And they fought out. Basically, they started, started two kingdoms. And so they split these tribes into two sets. Two sections, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So stupid, stupid gets dumber. And uh, so not only, so they're just kind of going through the. If you go through the Book of Kings and Chronicles, Kings and Chronicles, it kind of goes through all the history of all of this stuff of these things happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so king after king after this point, there's two separate kingdoms now. It was, was supposed to be one kingdom. Now there's two. There's Judah, and then there's there's uh, Israel. So Judah, out of the tribe of Judah and Israel, uh, from going all the way back to the name that was given to Jacob. Really, they're all children of Israel, but there's two kingdoms now because they split. Well, throughout all of this stupidity, uh, these guys are just making more and more mistakes, okay? And it really gets to the point where they have fought against each other so much that they've really weakened their nation. And not only that, they're making stupid decisions by trying to fight things that God has not intended them to fight and stick their noses in places where it wasn't supposed to happen. And so literally, these kingdoms get conquered. Okay? Is everybody with me? Yeah. No. So they get conquered. What happens whenever the kingdoms get conquered, uh, then another nation, this nation, uh, Babylon, Babylon comes in and li literally decimates everything. They tear the temples down. They tear they they tear the temple down. <coughs> they tear down all the walls of all the walled cities. They take what? Right? Mm -hmm. They tear down the temple. They tear down the walled cities. And not only that, they take all of the good smart kids. You know, like the gifted and talented kids. Um, you, anybody was in gifted and talented? Um, I hate you. <laughs> but you are not. <laughs> I. I, see, I remember in kindergarten, see, this is what happened. They, they take all the smart kids and they took them to Babylon to train them. They train them in the Babylonian way so that they can literally train them to be governors. They didn't want to waste manpower, so they trained the, the Israelite kids to go back and uh, rule, their, rule the nation that they conquered. But they want to train them in Babylonian law and all the religion that Babylon had, and then send them back to run it. Uh, I remember in kindergarten sitting there on a little blue mat, you know how you had to sleep on a blue mat? Yeah. All the smart kids, they didn't let sleep. They taught them how to read during the blue mat time. And so I remember sleep, sleeping in one eye open trying to learn how to read. Nice. I'd, probably be a better speller. Nice. I'd probably be a better speller today if they would let me sit at the table. But man, my spelling's horrible now. I probably wouldn't have been carried off to Babylon. But uh, Daniel, have you ever heard of Daniel? Mm -hmm. Daniel was carried off to Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, same. That's all pretty much the same story. It's found in the book of Daniel. 
And so this is what starts the era of the prophets, okay? And so after the kings are pretty much done, then the prophets, they come in. At the very end of all the kings, Isaiah is one of the last prophets of king time. He's prophesying two kings. So, so a lot of the first times, first of the prophecies that we find in the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament, they're prophesying to a kingdom. Well, all of a sudden, then there's no more kingdom, so they just start prophesying to the future of the kingdom. They're like, well, it's going to happen, this is going to happen, it's going to come back. Okay, does that make sense? And so Israel is literally decimated. So we have uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, I'm not, we're, we're just going to list out prophets, all the major and minor prophets. And so one of the key ones to, to all of eschatology and all end time knowledge, and everything that we know about the end times is in the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of these guys who um, was going, he, they put, I mean, we don't really catch it. Maybe so, we, t we talk about in Sunday school about the cute little story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the fiery furnace. And it's not really that fun, though, if you really think about it. They wouldn't bow to the, to the Babylonian God. And so they literally took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them in the fiery furnace, and God delivered them out of it. It's in the book of Daniel. Daniel was uh, also extremely, uh, extremely tested. He, Daniel was a very devout Jew. And he would literally pray toward Jerusalem out of his upper window every single day of his life. And so much so that people hated it. They didn't want to hear it, his prayers. They didn't like his God. They didn't want to know anything about it. Anybody have a similar experience in life? Well, this happened to Daniel. And so much so that they literally wanted to pass the law against Daniel. And uh, interesting that Daniel was a very blessed man and people liked him. But even the king liked him. King Ahasuerus, I think that's his name. Well, even the king liked him. Well, Daniel is, uh, he breaks the law by praying because they passed the law against him. They kind of slid it under the, under the rug on the king. So the king literally has to throw Daniel in the lion's den. Anybody remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Well, Daniel, it was only for one night, and God was going to shut the lion's mouth. We can go through it. But that's the cool part of the stories of the, the Sunday school stories of Daniel. But the story of Daniel that we don't hear a lot about is the revelation knowledge that Daniel possessed. Because Nebuchadnezzar was that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And Nebuchadnezzar came after, I think it was or whatever. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and it's the same thing that happened kind of to Joseph. All of a sudden, no one knows what this means. And literally, they bring Daniel before the king. And Daniel tells him what the dream is. Well, we read through chapter by chapter of chapter, the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was the whole entire revelation of all of time. <laughs> and Daniel told him what the dream was. And so when we go back through all those chapters of Daniel, we find that it lines up exactly with Revelation, the book of Revelation. And so the book of Daniel is very key. Also, a lot of small scriptures throughout all of scripture uh, in the Old Testament is very key to tying into this book. And so all these minor prophets happen, and then all of a sudden there's a 400-year silence. Happens at the end of Malachi. Malachi is the very last voice of the prophets, and then there's 400 years of silence. One of those last things is that all these people have finally gotten themselves back. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the kingdom. They got kind of everything together, but they're still not worshiping God. They're still not serving God. And they're like literally just being carnal. And uh, Malachi says, test me, try me. He's speaking for God. He says, why don't you just try paying your tithes? Why don't you just try giving your offering? See if I won't bless you. Just trying something, anything. They literally would not even do the littlest things. They've been like paying, paying for the king, paying for the temple. And so literally there's 400 years of silence. And that's the end of the Old Testament. So right when you get there. Does anyone got that? Let's take a break. Let's take a break. Is it almost eight? It's confusing. And it doesn't take an hour to set up the idea of what's happening. Um, and so let's look at that. Turn your notes over and look at that back couple pages. You see the timeline thing? All the weird graphics? You're looking right at it. There's one that says feast. So I don't want you to look at that one yet. Okay. The one I want you to look at is uh, <clears throat> well, we'll look at the blank one. Just look at the one with no words so far. Okay. So in the New Testament, let's just say that this is the New Testament. I'm going to write for a minute. Is the camera going in? So this is the New Testament. We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which we talked about earlier. Is the Gospels, the death, or is the, the birth, 
The prophecy, the birth, the life of Jesus Christ, all of his miracles, all of his teachings, everything that happened in Jesus Christ's life, okay? Not only that, his crucifixion, not only that, his burial, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, but not only that, in the Gospels, which a lot of people kind of forget, that he also stayed on this earth for 40 days, and he taught his disciples and all the people around for 40 more days after he ascended, or after he was risen from the grave. And so we got the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ right here, right? Who's with me? Is this camera still going? Okay, so let's just, let's just signify the Gospels with the cross, right? Everybody with me? Yeah. So that's that's the cross, okay? So what happened right after the cross? We have the ascension, right? And so let's just let's just put a little arrow, like right after the cross, there's this little arrow, just a little representation of Jesus ascending, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus ascending. He said, well, he, uh, I can't quote all the scripture right now. He said, if I don't ascend, then I'm not going to be able to send something back, right? Speaking of the Holy Ghost. He said, unless I go away. Okay, so what happened in Acts chapter 2 that we talked about earlier? The church started. The church has started. Well, how did it start? He tells them to tarry in Jerusalem. So they tarry in Jerusalem for 7 to 10 days, depending on how you do your math. That's the upper room experience. That's the upper room experience. But what happened is the Holy Ghost came down from heaven, right? Yep. And it, it started something. It started what we, can, we call the church age, right? And so, in the church age, uh, the church is represented in uh, Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 as seven golden candlesticks, representing one candlestick per church. That was a broad representation of the entire church age, okay? And so, when I say church age, everyone say church age. Church age, church age is what we're living in. Yep, that's true. It's the age of the church. There's one, there was a beginning of the age of the church, and there's going to be an end. Does anybody guess what the end of the church age will be? Rapture. Rapture. Okay. And so let's let's draw that seven golden candlestick thing in here as the church age. So the Holy Ghost came, right? And then there's the seven golden candlesticks. Did I get that? Seven golden candlesticks. That's horrible. Okay. So at the end of the church age, then something happens, right? What happens? Uh, the rapture. So all of a sudden, the people are raptured, right? And so this is the age of the church. Let's just draw a little, a little hoop in here that's not on your thing. This is the church age, right? This whole entire dispensation. Was, when I say dispensation, I mean a, a section of time. A dispensation. This would be the Old Testament dispensation, okay? And we're talking about the church age dispensation, so this is the church age. And so this, this, if that's the church age, what dispensation would this have been during the cross and all that? What would that have been? The Gospels? The yeah. dispensation of the Gospels? Is that right? Yep. It's like around the cross, before the cross, just after the cross for 40 days. So this would be the Gospels? The time of the Gospels? Someone help me out. Where is the end of the Old, Te Old Testament? Um, the end. end of the Old Testament? Yeah. Help me point to it. Let me point you to the end, end of the Old Testament. The Old Covenant, Old Testament, all, all of everything before G, before the promise of the New Testament. Anybody help me out? 4 BC? Huh? 4 BC? Nope. No. That's when the last book of the Bible you're talking about, right? Huh? No. Yeah. No. Anybody? Okay, the end of the Old Testament would also be the beginning of the New Testament. Is it, but does anybody understand what a testament is? A testament? It's, the testament is like a it's like a promise, a covenant. And so the end of the old promise and the start of the new. Where did the new promise start? Before Jesus Christ. Nope. What you say? The birth of Jesus Christ. Nope. The uh, Last Supper with Jesus Christ. Getting closer, but no. Nope. Nope. Where? Started whenever the promise came, Holy Ghost came down. Um, right? So the beginning of the Old Testament, or the, the ending of the Old Testament is the beginning of the New Testament. It didn't happen until after the Gospels, right? Right? Okay. 
So this is the this is the line of between OT and, and New Testament. So even though uh, even though our Bible, what in the world? I can't write. I'm about to get Sarah back up here. So if this is the Old Testament New Testament line. What does it? Does everyone understand why is the why that's the line? Because everyone before the church, they were Jews or they were Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone after the church, they, they were Christians, mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Ghost, part of the New Covenant, New Testament. And so, interestingly enough, our Bible put the line in the wrong spot. It was man's problem, not ours, or not God's. God did not intend for that to happen. Uh, Jesus Christ, all of his life was in the Old Testament. Everything he did was still OT. And so whenever you see the, th the, the, the thief that died on the cross next to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. he says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. That was the very last Jew that we have any record of dying in the Old Testament. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he's the last dude. From the day that the Holy Ghost fell, everything changed. The Old Testament's wiped away. Old Covenant's gone. Let me get deeper into that. The New Testament starts, which was, if you want to be part of the Old Testament, if you wanted to be in this promises of Abraham, what did you have to do? If you wanted to be in Abraham's covenant. The, 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 mark, the mark that was, that was changing, that, that, that uh, made you part of, the Abrahamic covenant was circumcision. It was a. It was something that they required, as from from Abraham all the way down. Okay. What is the mark of the New Testament promise that represents the Old Testament circumcision? Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood. Okay. Because instead of our blood being shed, it was His. Okay. But what else? Was Mark was being covered in that blood. How did he get covered? In that blood? <coughs> baptism. So baptism is the New Testament circumcision, and that's that's easily I can show you in Scripture in the New Testament. For right now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go there. But to be in the covenant of the New Testament, just like you had to be in the covenant of the Old Testament by circumcision, to be in the covenant of the New Testament is through baptism, because that's how you take on that name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, for the remission of your sins, baptized for the remission of your sins. And so that's how our sins are remitted. Like in the Old Testament, it was through a sacrifice, sacrificial lamb, but in the New Testament, there's all kinds of this. Now, I'm talking about typology now, and I don't want to get too confusing. But the New Testament, the New Testament circumcision is baptism. Okay. But we know that whenever Peter got up and preached on Acts chapter 2, they said, what shall we, uh, uh, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Right? The Jewish people cried out after Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. Before the Holy Ghost came, the Jewish people they said, Oh my God, we've sacrificed, we killed, we killed the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We killed him. Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? How are we gonna get how do we get out of this condemnation? And Peter, what did Peter say to him? Repent. Repent. So we have to repent of our sins. This is the whole entire process of New Testament circumcision. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for your mis for the remission of sins. You shall, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. One part is God's part. Just like in the Old Testament, the part that, if you go back and you read in Genesis chapter 15, the covenant was, was instituted uh, with blood. Genesis chapter 14, 15, 16, I don't know if it's Okay, well, anyway, the covenant was instituted.